Good morning, Grace. Glad that you're here today. Glad that uh, any of us are here today because of the blizzard that we had and, and all that snow out there. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, well, I can't do anything about the weather. People have asked me that for years and I've said, sorry, I'm in sales, not management. <laughs> so I can't do anything about the weather, but... Uh, it's good to see you and it's good to be in the house of the Lord together. There are churches that have canceled services today. First Norfolk I saw is closed. Severn Church is closed and others are closed, but we are open and I guess you knew that because you are here. Uh, we are doing the Art of Neighboring book on Wednesday nights for our Hurried Family Supper. And today's sermon is the follow-on to that. Today you are getting a very Presbyterian sermon. So I'm just warning you ahead of time, it's going to be a very Presbyterian sermon. I have no other announcements this morning other than to welcome you and those who are watching and uh, participating online this morning. And our liturgist today is Barbara Fleming. Good morning. Sarah Harris was supposed to be here today, so be kind to me, please. <laughs> we're, well, we're glad you've joined us this morning, this very cold morning. You know, if I wanted to be, to be 22 degrees, I would have stayed in New Jersey. <laughs> uh, those of you who are on Facebook are, were pro are probably a lot warmer, or at least, uh, well, maybe. But the ride down here was a tad chilly. Uh, couldn't get my... Uh, heat on until about 15 minutes into the ride, and it only takes 20 minutes to get here. <laughs> so if you are a guest or a visitor today, we extend, ex extend an especially warm welcome to you. I'm here it is. I was looking for this. There should be a little card in the pew rack if you're a visitor, if, if you would fill it out and put it in the offering plate so we get to know you a little bit better. Okay, uh, I also have no additional announcements.
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join me in the call to worship responsibly, responsibly as found on the screen and in your bulletin. The Spirit of God is upon us. We are called to be God's people. The Spirit of God is upon us. We are called to be the body of Christ. Come, let us worship God who binds us together in love and service. Let us pray. Righteous God, forgive us for our apathy. Open our eyes to see the world around us. Shed light on those we've turned a blind eye to. Break our hearts for what breaks yours. Holy Spirit, we, we rely on your strength and goodness to motivate us to make a difference. Convict us in your word today and move us to action. We ask these things in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Please stand if you're able for our opening song.
cries and laughter, prayers of faith and songs of grace. Let this house proclaim from floor to rafter, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare approach God in confidence. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God together in the corporate prayer of confession, followed by our silent personal prayer of confession. Shepherd of Israel, God of hosts, we have turned away from you, neglecting the welfare of your creation, ignoring the plight of your people, trampling on the creatures and the plants you have made, taking from earth what we cannot give back. We have not helped our neighbors in need, kept peace within our families, or tended the vine you have planted in our lives. Forgive us and lead us to a more gracious life. In your compassion, turn us to your way. Restore us, O Lord of hosts. Let us, your faith shine upon us, and we shall be saved. Amen. Amen. In the book of Isaiah, God says, In my surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you. He says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. And he says, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Let us receive the good news of the gospel, knowing that God is compassionate towards us, and he's wiped out all of our sins. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
children have left, okay. <laughs> As we prepare to read the scriptures this morning, please join me in prayer. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scripture are, scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 17, verses 22 to 27. On his second missionary journey, Paul has crossed Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey, and has arrived in Athens, a city known for its interest in the divine and for its openness to discussion of philosophies and religions. He now tells the good news to those gathered at the edge of the marketplace. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to, to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There will be a quiz after the service today to find out if you have understood what the Presbyterian part of this sermon is. So let's pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks. We thank you for our neighbors. We thank you for our friends. We thank you for your church of which we are a part. Help us to hear now of our opportunity, our opportunity to be missionaries, to be evangelists, to be those who care for our community. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Two weeks ago tomorrow, Luann and I traveled to the Cox Communications store in Newport News to return a television cable box we no longer used. We ran a few errands, we ate lunch out, mid-afternoon we returned to Gloucester, and as we crossed the Coleman Bridge, I looked across the water, the sun was shining, it was a glorious day, we were surrounded by trees and water and the beauty of Gloucester County, and I remarked, I love living here. LAUGHTER and then it snowed. No. <laughs> Luann immediately agreed. This is our home. It has been for going on 19 years. Now, how did a hillbilly coal cracker from Newcastle, Pennsylvania, and a Jersey girl by way of the Philadelphia main line end up in Gloucester, Virginia? Well, I'm not sure I've ever shared the full story from the pulpit, so I'm going to do that today. On Palm Sunday, 1998, I stood in the pulpit of First Presbyterian Church in Fremont, Ohio, and announced that as far as I could discern God's will at that time, I would serve out my ministry in Fremont, Ohio. I did not intend for my announcement to get the reaction that it did. I just shared what I thought God was telling me. I got a standing ovation. And the next year, 1999, my dad passed away after a 12-year battle with prostate cancer. And by the year 2000, it became obvious that my mom could not take care of the house and property where I grew up. We had three and a half acres 
my dad had a wheel horse tractor that my mom was not even heavy enough to hold down the cutoff switch on the seat. Now, if she mowed the grass with a sack of concrete on her lap, she could have probably done that, but she didn't. And mom would be moving to Culpeper, Virginia to live with my brother and his family and help raise his children. Meanwhile, Luann's parents were moving to Pittsburgh, North Carolina from Philadelphia. Aging parents would no longer be three and eight hours away. Sensing the importance of family after my dad's death and my desire to continue to minister to both Luann's family and my family without too much travel, I had a sudden realization. I had misspoken. I had not properly discerned God's will. And for family reasons, I knew I couldn't stay in the church in Fremont forever. So quietly, under the radar, as Presbyterians are forced to do, I updated my CV and bio, my PIF from the old ways, the pastor information form, and I began a search for a new call somewhere closer to where Luann's parents and my mom were, and my brother too. I looked at larger churches, doors opened, doors shut. I got interviews and was invited to visit churches in person, Midlothian, Virginia, Jamestown and Fuquay, Verena, North Carolina, Pittsburgh, York, Pennsylvania, and Lebanon, Pennsylvania. I even preached a couple of live in-person sermons for pastor nominating committees in neutral pulpits. Doors continued to shut. And suddenly a Presbyterian church in Gloucester, Virginia popped up on my radar. A good interview by phone with the committee was followed up with a visit on site. I came alone for that visit. And here we are almost 19 years later. When we arrived, we were quickly identified as come here's. We're from up north, but you all knew that when you called me. It wasn't anything new to you. But after a year, Charlene Whitaker of this congregation said, you're not a come here, you're a sent here. I believe that then and I believe that now. I'm enough of a Presbyterian to believe in the providence of God. And as a result of that belief, it's not a coincidence that any of us are here, in this place, at this time. In this morning's scripture passage, the Apostle Paul is in Athens. This is the birthplace of Western civilization. This is the womb of philosophy. Paul first goes to the synagogues in Athens and he engages the Jewish leaders and devout persons with the gospel. He questions their understanding of the law and its application. And then he heads to the marketplace, the Agora. This is the place of public debate. This is where the teachers would walk through the streets of the marketplace debating and talking and dialoguing with their students. And Paul debates the Epicureans and the Stoics. These are the two sides of the Greek philosophical coin. The Epicureans believe that everything happens by chance, that there is no afterlife, and that the gods were remote from human experience. Human life, they just didn't care. And their conclusion, as Epicureans, was that pleasure is the chief end of life, or at least not suffering. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. On the flip side, the Stoics believed that everything is God, that everything that happens is God's will, and that in the end everyone will return to God. But their philosophy was kind of, life is really hard and then you die. <laughs> now Paul's been preaching and Paul has been asking questions. The citizens are confused. Who is this man? Who, who sent him here? What is his message? 
He's preaching about Jesus. He's telling them of the resurrection, and they say, we, we want to hear more. So they bring him to the Areopagus, Mars Hill, the court where murders and moral issues are tried. And they ask, we want to know about this new teaching. As a center of culture, the elite were always interested in the latest news, the latest teaching, the latest new thing, the most recent philosophy. And so Paul begins to preach. Paul is a keen observer. He has walked in Athens. Everywhere he looks, there is a shrine, a temple, an altar, a grove, or a plaque dedicated to a god of some type. So Paul starts out where they are. And he commends them for their religious nature. He commends them for trying to understand spiritual things. And yet he notices something really unusual. He has passed an altar dedicated to an unknown God. <laughs> it's almost humorous. You can almost see a group of the city fathers walking around doing a census. Okay, we have a temple to Zeus, and we have a shrine to Athena, and an altar to Demeter, a chapel for Aphrodite, a, a temple for Apollo, and so on it went. And then one of them says, wait a second, wait a second, what if we've forgotten one of the gods? They're going to be ticked. Won't they be angry? We'd better do something. And so they erect an altar dedicated to an unknown God just to be safe. And that's the chink in their armor. This is the opening that Paul sees or seeks. He finds common ground with his hearers. His sermon is simple yet powerful. It's contextual. It would probably never work any place else, but it works here. And one of the things Paul says is so profound. We find it in verses 26 and 27 of Acts 17. From one ancestor, he, God, made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. And he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. Now, those two sentences are an affirmation of the sovereignty of God and several other truths. First truth, one God made us. Paul pulls no punches. He's addressing Greeks in Athens in a culture that recognizes multiple gods. We remember Olympus and Zeus and Athena and Aphrodite from our early education. There were 12 Olympians, and I don't mean the ones who go to the games and come back. The gods who lived on Olympus. Sometimes much is communicated in what is not said because Paul does not say, from one ancestor, they, the gods, made all of us. He says, from one ancestor, he, one God made all of us. Paul focuses on that altar, that temple constructed to an unknown God. He identifies this God in verses 23b to 26 of chapter 17. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things from one ancestor, he made all nations. Now this is the truth that Paul proclaims. One God intentionally made us. We are not an accident. We are not merely highly evolved animals. Scripture tells us that we have been made in the image of God. We have dignity. We have worth. We have purpose. Herman Bavinck gets it, or gets it. There's a typo in my script. Herman Bavinck gets it, not at. <laughs> when he writes, the image of God is much too richly gifted, or excuse me, much too rich for it to be fully realized in a single human being. Think about that for a moment. 
The image of God is much too rich for it to be realized in a single human being, however richly gifted that human being may be. It can only be somewhat unfolded in its depths and riches in a humanity counting billions of members. The image of God is an undeserved gift of grace that was given to the first human being immediately at the creation, but at the same time is the grounding principle and germ of an altogether rich and glorious development. God made us. Second, God made us from one ancestor. We're all related. There's no room for prejudice, racism, or discrimination. There's no place for hatred. The children's song that we learned when we were in Sunday school proclaims red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. There's only one race to which we belong. And that's the human race. Some of us are still aspiring to that. Now that's a new teaching for the Greeks. Historians portray Greece as the cradle of democracy. It was. Many also portray Greece as a highly evolved egalitarian society that should be the model for how we treat one another today. But that's a false portrayal. Greco-Roman elites were often systemic and rational in their attitudes toward race and ethnicity, but always consistently bigoted, far more so than any Western society today. The Greeks thought they were the bee's knees, and everybody else wasn't. But Paul will have none of it. If God made us all, we're all on equal terms. We are all related to God. We are all kin to one another. And if God made us, then God shapes our identity. God is intricately involved with the who of who we are. We are not an accident. And Paul also says that God determines when we are. Not just who we are, but when we are. Here again what Paul says. From one ancestor, he, God, made all nations to inhabit the earth, and he allotted the times of their existence. Verse 26. Which means you are on planet earth right now for a reason. Hidden in the depth and mystery of who God is and why God made you, and why God made you at this particular time. God placed you here. And even more importantly, God placed you here now for a reason. Have you ever had a sense that you were born in this particular time for a purpose? I have. I believe that. If God is sovereign, if God's providence is true, then my being in this spot at this time, in this place, is no accident. My who, my identity, my dignity and value as a human being is determined by the God who gave me life. I have a purpose. And my when is determined by God. I have a purpose now. The Greeks identified two different kinds of time. One type is chronos time. That's a chronometer. Most people call it a wristwatch. Most people have a digital. I'm old school. It's time as we all experience it, moving from one second, one minute, one day, one week, one month to the next. It is chronological, sequential time. But the other type of time that the Greeks recognized and it's spoken of in the New Testament is kairos time. That's significant time. This kind of time is the movement of God in our lives. When I accepted Christ, that was a kairos moment. When I was married, that was a kairos moment. When my children were born, that was a kairos moment. When my father and mother passed away, that was a kairos moment. It's time with meaning, time with purpose. Sometimes things happen that make us wonder, God, was this why I was created? Why I'm here now? Let me give you an example. 
You won't remember her name, but you'll remember the incident. Ashley Smith was just getting her life back together. As a 26-year-old single mom, she had had a rough journey. A Christian upbringing, but a youthful rebellion, brushes with the law, some drug issues, jobs found and lost, and finally marriage and a little girl. Four years before, her husband had died in her arms from a stab wound, suffered because of a violent attack on them both. On that night in March of 2005, she was just getting settled in the apartment she had moved into two days earlier. When she returned from her 2 a.m. run to the store, accused killer Brian Nichols forced his way into her apartment at gunpoint. Nichols was the the object of the largest manhunt in Georgia history after his deadly escape from a downtown courtroom where he left the judge and three others shot to death. And later he shot another man. Initially he bound and gagged Ashley. Eventually he began to trust her enough to give her some freedom and for seven hours she began to talk to the killer in her living room. She talked about her own battles of her life, about the little daughter she was supposed to pick up the next morning, and about her newly reborn faith With his permission, she read to him from the book she was reading, The Purpose Driven Life. Ultimately, he allowed Ashley to leave after she had seemingly persuaded him to consider ending the killing and to give himself up peacefully. After she called law enforcement, as he almost surely knew she would, they swarmed around that apartment only to see him come out quietly with his hands up and surrender. Later, Ashley recalled some extraordinary things that Brian Nichols had said to her. He told her he thought she was an angel sent from God, that he was lost and that God had led him right to her so she could tell him from the well of her own hurt how the people he had hurt were feeling. She told him he was a child of God and that she wanted him to do God's will. And then she said again, or excuse me, then she said, I guess he began to want to. For days, the national media talked repeatedly about those extraordinary seven hours and the incredible young woman who had helped end a bloodbath. And she said it was not her at all. It was the God who was leading her now purpose-driven life. Who we are is according to God's purpose. When we are is according to God's purpose. Where we are is according to God's purpose. And that's what Paul says next. And the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and ultimately find him. Now, when we moved to Gloucester, we initially lived in the manse on South Street. The the house is no longer there. When we built the new addition, that was one of the first things to come down because the parking lot was going to go where our house was. But when we moved here, our home in Ohio had not sold, and the housing market here was on fire. I mean on fire. Everything that came up for sale that was something we might want to buy sold within days. We prayed for our house to sell. We prayed for a house to buy. In December of 2003, our first year here, one of the first funerals I did in Gloucester was the funeral of Violet Morgan. Those of you who are older members of the church remember Violet. On a whim, I said to her son, Joe, if and when you get around to selling your family home, we would be interested in putting a bid on it. I thought we might as well get our dibs in early just in case our house sells. Now remember, our house hadn't sold in Ohio yet. It was an act of faith. We had no success in finding a house close to the church or even remotely distant from the church. Matthews County, Gwynn's Island, nothing. We prayed about it and trusted God to provide. Two years later, after that initial conversation, our house in Ohio sold, the Morgans accepted our bid, and we moved in. And we live in that house 
today, we've lived there for 17 years. I couldn't ask for a better location. I can walk to the church, we can walk uptown, we have great neighbors, and though we are three blocks from Main Street, we are surrounded by woods on three sides. It's a Kairos moment. Everything came together in God's time, not my time. So let's review. I am who I am because of a sovereign God. I am when I am because of a sovereign God. And I am where I am because of a sovereign God. And you are as well. And so are your neighbors. In about 20 minutes, you will leave here to return to the home and the neighborhood in which God has placed you. You will return to the home God has given you. You will go back to your home and your neighborhood as the person God created you to be, uniquely gifted, having certain memories, experiences, personality quirks, concerns, sense of humor, hurts, and blessings that will allow you to connect to the other people who are around you. You will go back to your home and neighborhood on this day at this time with neighbors near you and around you that perhaps five years ago weren't there. But the ones who are around you now are the ones God has placed in your path. Let this be a Kairos moment. A Kairos moment for you and for this congregation. Ask God to help you see your neighborhood and your neighbors with fresh eyes. Do you know your neighbors? Do you know their names? Do you know the names of their children? Especially that 80-year-old couple across the street. No, they, they don't have children. Well, they do, but they're not here. Do you know anything about them? Do you know where they work? Are you aware of any struggles they face? Is there any way that you can connect and show God's love for them? Because they're not there at this time by accident. And neither are you. Jesus said to his disciples and to you and to me, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the household. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You are light in your neighborhood. You are salt in your neighborhood. Let's go and be the salt and light this week in our closest mission the closest mission field that God has given us, right outside our back door. We don't have to go to Africa or South America or Asia. We only need to cross the street or knock on a door. And that's no accident. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Amen. As we give today, may we do so in love, in joy, in prayer, in thanksgiving, and in unselfishness. Let us continue to worship God as we offer ourselves and our gifts.
gracious God, with thanks we offer the gifts of our hands and the fruits of our labors. Accept them as expressions of our response to the life and love you have given us. Amen. Good morning. Please join me in prayer. Dear God, thank you that you make all things new. Thank you for all that you've allowed into our lives this past year, the good along with the hard things, which have reminded us how much we need you and rely on your presence filling us every day. We pray for your spirit to lead us each step of this new year. We ask that you will guide our decisions and turn our hearts to deeply desire you above all else. We ask that you will open doors needing to be open and close ones needing to be shut tight. We ask for your wisdom, for your strength and power to be constantly present within us. We pray you make us strong and courageous for the plans you have for us. Give us the ability beyond what we feel able. Let your gifts flow fully freely through us so that you would be honored by our lives and others would be drawn to you. We pray that you'd keep us far from the snares and traps of temptations, that you would whisper in our ear when we need to run and whisper in our heart when we need to stand our ground. God bless our pastor and staff and all those Sunday school and nursery caregivers involved with teaching our young people right now as we pray. Show your grace and healing on all those in our congregation that are suffering. Be close to those listening to our newsletter and on the prayer list. In the name of the patient, insightful, and healing Christ, we offer these prayers, and we join in the prayer that Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Worship today within Christ alone. <coughs>
out with a sense of purpose. Go out with a sense of call today that God has placed his call on your life to serve him where you are in this time where he has placed you. And then prayerfully consider what that call might mean, who that call might include, and how you might obey that call. And may the grace, mercy, and peace of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.